Uh, to begin, we'll start with roll call. Senator Cooper? Here. Senator French? Here. Senator Kolb? Here. Senator Cost? Here. And Chairman Nethercott? Here. All right, just some um, points of courtesy, good senators. You do have microphones in front of you. Um, when you are called upon to speak or you have a question, you'll need to turn your microphone on and for members of the public as well. There's a red light, which means your microphone is off. You just push the button that says push and the, the light will turn green. And that means your microphone is available um, and hot for you to speak into. So just a reminder to turn on your microphones. Also good senators, um, if you are uh, on Zoom with us on your laptops here, be sure to mute here and use the microphone on your um, desk. So we'll work through, we're, we will work through this technology and all will be well. Good senators, as a reminder and members of the public, we will be gaveling in upstairs at 10 a.m. So that leaves us only uh, about an hour and 45 minutes to get through these bills before us. Good thing today we have a pretty easy load dealing with just two bills, Senate File 90, HIMP prohibitions and requirements, uh, and then Senate File 25, which is a re-referral from the Ag Committee, from their, their interim work to this committee for us to make that bill a little more lawful. So we look forward to hearing from everyone um, on these two bills uh, before us this morning. And with that, we will start with Senate File 90, Hemp Prohibitions and Requirements. Our good colleague here, Senate Judiciary, Senator Cost, uh, it's his bill. And so Senator Cost, if you would like to present your bill for us and walk us through what it does and why you're bringing it, we sure would appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members of the Judiciary Committee, today I'm presenting for you Senate File 90, which is Hemp Prohibitions and Requirements. This bill started out as an ag uh, study and present a presentation as a bill during the summer. And in our work, it was decided that the bill that originally was created was not intended in the way that originally this was supposed to be. So I was talking to the chief of police in our area and I said, I wanted to rewrite the bill. We have a challenge. There is smokable hemp. And of course, marijuana is smokable as well. The problem is our police are handcuffed because they have no way of knowing whether hemp or marijuana is being smoked. In order to eliminate that challenge and respect the ability for medically hemp to assist others, I felt it necessary for us to try to do something with smokable hemp so that our police are not caught in the problem. And yet still, it's still usable to the people that say this helps them with their medical problems. In doing so, this bill was reduced to what I feel is a much more compatible bill for the needs of what we were trying to do. In reading through the bill, we'll start on page one with the act and it says, an act relating to hemp production prohibiting the use of smokable hemp in public, prohibiting the sale of smokable hemp to those under the age of 21, providing criminal and other penalties, requiring labeling of edible hemp products as specified and providing for an effective date. So if you come down, you will notice that we're gonna create a couple of uh, statutes, Wyoming statute 11-51-108 and 14-3-109 are created to read. 1151-108 prohibited uses of hemp penalties. This starts with on line 14 on page one with Romanet A, no individual shall knowingly or intentionally smoke any product containing hemp in a public place. An ind individual who violates this subsection 
is guilty of a misdemeanor, and that's on page two, lines one and lines two. The punishments are line four, Roman et I, for the first offense, a fine of not more than $50. You go down to line seven, Roman et two I, for the second offense, a fine not more than $100. And on line 10, Romanet 3i, for a third or subsequent offense, by a fine not more than $500. And that's all there is to it. It's just saying, public, in public, please don't smoke him. On 14-3-109, sale of smokable hemp products, what this does is parallels the hemp smoking for those persons under the age of 21 to the same rules of cigarettes. So it goes through with no person shall sell, offer for sale or give <clears throat> away or deliver smokable hemp or smokable hemp products to any person under the age of 21 years of age. On line 19, Romanet B, any person violating subsection A of this section is guilty of a misdemeanor punished by a fine of not more than, you go to page three, line one, Romanet I, $250 for a first violation. The court may allow the defendant to perform community service and be granted credit against his fine and court cost at the rate of $10 for each hour of work performed. And of course, this is the same as the cigarette uh, violations. On line seven, Romanet 2i, $500 for a second violation committed within a 24 month period, regardless of the locations where the violations occurred. And again, the court may allow the defendant to perform community service and be granted credit against his fine and court costs at the rate of $10 for each hour of work performed. Line 15, Romanet 3, $750 for the third or subsequent violations committed within a 24 month period, regardless of the locations. And the court may allow the defendant to perform community service and be granted credit against his fine and court costs at the rate of $5 for each hour performed. We go to page four. Romanet C on line one, no retailer shall sell, permit the sale, offer for sale, give away or deliver smokable hemp or smokable hemp products to any person under the age of 21 years. The violations on line six, Romanet D, any person violating subsection C of this section is guilty of a misdemeanor punishable by a fine of not more than $250 for a first violation which is lines 10, Romanet I, uh, and 11. On lines 13, Romanet II, $500 for a second violation committed during a 24 month period. Line 16, Romanet III, $750 for a third or subsequent violation committed during 24 month period. On line 20, Romanet E, in addition to the penalties under paragraph Romanet D, Romanet 3 of this section, any person violating subsection Romanet D of this section by committing a third or subsequent offense within 24 month period may be subject to an injunction. The Department of Revenue or District Attorney of the County in which the offense occurred may petition the district court for an injunction to prohibit the sale of smokable hemp products in the establishment where the violation occurred. If the court finds that the respondent in the action has violated the provisions of subsection Romanet D of this section for a third or subsequent time within a two year period and may continue to violate such provisions, it may grant an injunction prohibiting the respondent from selling smokable hemp products in the establishment where the violation occurred for a period of not more than 180 days. For the purposes of this subsection, multiple violations occurring before the petition for the injunction is filed shall be deemed part of the violation for which the injunction is sought. If the person against whom the injunction is sought operates multiple 
geographically separate establishes the injunction shall apply only to the establishment where the violation occurred. The injunction shall prohibit all sales of smokable hemp products in the establishment where the violation occurred, regardless of any change in ownership or management of the establishment that is not a bona fide arms link transaction while the injunction is in effect. Romanet F on line four on page, <clears throat> excuse me, six. It is an affirmative defense to the prosecution under subject sections Romanet B and Romanet D of this section that in the case of the sale, the person who sold the smokable hemp product was presented with and reasonably relied upon an identification card which identified the person buying or receiving the smokable hemp product as being over the age of 21 years of age. Section two, Romanet 1151-102, uh, I'm sorry, Wyoming statute 1151-102 Romanet B, and by creating a new subsection C and 35-7-1063 Romanet A, Romanet 3I are amended to read, hemp is an agricultural crop, use of <clears throat> the use of hemp, notwithstanding the requirements of this chapter, the possession, purchase, sale, transportation, and use of hemp and hemp products by any person is allowable, except as provided in Wyoming Statute 1151-108 and 14-3109. On page seven, line one, Romanet C, any hemp product marked or intended for consumption as food or beverage shall include a label on the package of the product that lists all active and inactive ingredients of the food or beverage product that contains hemp or cannabinoid. Not noting in this, I'm sorry, noting in this subsection shall be construed to supersede any other application of federal or state labeling requirements. And then on 35-7-1063, Exceptions to the provisions, it was added on line 14, Romanet 3i, hemp product production, processing, or testing in accordance with the provisions of Wyoming Statute 1151-101 through 1151-108 and 14-3-109. The effective date is July 1st, 2021. What this last part is, is only a protection of our consumers to understand what's in the edible product. So if there's something that it's an allergy for them, they're protected by the knowledge that they understand that. It's not to limit, it's not to curtail anything. It's just saying, please put the ingredients on so that if somebody has allergies, they are aware of what they're eating. Uh, like with many other things, you'll see in a lot of stores and a lot of places where they, identify peanut allergies and that and stuff may have peanuts in it. And so um, that's the only reason that was there is to protect the consumers to know what's in the particular product. Some, most products are already labeled. There are some that we found that don't have to be labeled. And so this was to try to keep that where it was protectable through all. So with that, I would entertain any questions from the committee. Questions from the committee? Thank you, Senator Cost. Senator Kolb. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, specifically, in a public place, we go back to uh, long, uh, page one, line 15. Yep. Is, uh, was there a reason why we didn't, uh, we want to only prohibit it in a public place compared to a anywhere uh, using a smokable product? Senator Cost? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Senator Cole, yes, the purpose is not to try to limit or control the use of the hemp. It's just to try to take the handcuffs off of our police when they're in a situation in public where they've either come up to somebody that was smoking hemp or a car that they've stopped or whatever. And now, there's a possibility that it could be marijuana, could be hemp, and they can't tell. Uh, there has been some testimony that has said there's um, 
instruments out there that can measure to determine the difference. And uh, I had police chief and some others check into this to make sure that that was right. It turns out that is not true. There are some out there, but they are not effective at yet. So at this point, something they could purchase that would be able to determine what it is and what the content is, is not uh, really reliable in the in the public. So all this is is to say, just don't do it into in public so that the police can't tell is it hemp, is it marijuana. That way, we're protecting our police from saying, "Okay, I don't know." Uh, with the medical releases in Montana and the recreational releases and all, that people can say this is hemp and it's really marijuana. So that was the whole purpose of this to try to eliminate that problem. Thank you. Okay, Senator French. Uh, yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Cost, uh, if can you clarify something for me, please? On page two, um, line 13, sale of smokable hemp products, is that the penalty? Then on uh, line 15 through 17, no person shall sell, offer for sale, give away or deliver smokable hemp or smokable hemp products to any person under the age of 21 years. Then it refers to that again on page four, at the top uh, on C one through four. So that retailer, can they sell to people over 21 then? How does that correlate to, can that person over 21, if they buy it, it's just, uh, can they smoke it in public? I mean, is, are the police still going to have an issue with, well, it's still being sold to anyone over 21, and how are we going to determine if it's marijuana or hemp? Senator Kant. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator French, this part is directly related to the sale of cigarettes, so it just pretty much changed cigarettes to hemp. So as far as being able to smoke it in public, the public restriction is still going to be there. Now, you can't control, obviously, if you buy hemp and you give it to uh, smokable hemp and you give it to a child or whatever, that if it's in your own place or wherever, that's no control. I mean, police can't overreach that and that's not the intent. The intent of the first part is don't smoke it in public. You can buy it, that's perfectly okay. If an adult can buy it, they just are not supposed to smoke it in public. So they can take it home. The testimony I've had from a number of people who are producers of hemp say this stuff is not the most enjoyable thing to smoke. And so therefore they even have a hard time trying to understand why some people would wanna smoke it. But I have had people that said, it really does help them with certain problems that they have. And I'm certainly not here to try to keep that away from them. We're just saying that in private would be better than in public. And pretty much most of the ones that I have talked to say, I don't think I'd want to be smoking it anywhere else anyway. So that's pretty much where that ended up. But does that answer your question? Um, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator French, follow up? Yes, please. Um, yes. And kind of aside from that, um, where it seems to be an issue with the police being able to determine whether it's hemp or marijuana. What if they, how, how would they handle a, let's say some, somebody calls in, they, they should go to somebody's house and they smell that they think it's marijuana but it's actually hemp that they've been smoking in their home. How are they gonna make that? Are they gonna to have to test it or how are they gonna make that determination at that point? Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator French, again, now this is just public. So in private, the rules would take over for the police in any kind of an investigation like that. What they would do at that point 
would take samples of whatever this material is and send it in to have it evaluated. Uh, that evaluation takes approximately nine to 10 grams of the substance at uh, anywhere from 10 to $15 per gram. If you have 10 grams of it and you're sending in, that could be 100 to $150 worth of this person's product that you're sending in because it takes that much to be able to determine the level of uh, material in it. Therefore, that's where they have to deal with, okay, is this something, if it comes back as hemp, how do we reimburse the person? Because once it's been worked on or evaluated, it's not good anymore. So is the police responsible for paying or re refurnishing this person with whatever they had taken? Uh, that is a different story. That was what started out with the first one. And that's part of what we're saying this eliminates the majority of it because this is where we see the majority of that taking place in the house obviously is a criminal investigation the whole works if that would be the circumstance it wouldn't be this kind of a it, it wouldn't touch this particular uh statute thank you senator cost uh senator cooper thank you madam chair senator cost <clears throat> And I'm apparently missing something. Is there provisions out there right now for the sale of this hemp? And and how is it sold or how is it regulated and how is it taxed? Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Cooper, actually, uh, I believe all of us received some pictures from uh, the chief of police in Powell showing hemp in a local store in either Cody or Lovell where both of them have products available in hemp, they're in jars, and they can take the amount of anyone they want. Um, that's a different story. We're not looking at restriction of those or anything. Could those be something else? That would be an investigation if somebody thought so, they'd have to go into a, I would assume, a police investigation of that, and that's not the intent of this. It's just, it is out there, and it is available. You can go to Cody and you can buy it. You can, and right now, the sad part is a five-year-old could go to Cody and buy it because there's no limit on smokable hemp, and yet they can't buy a cigarette, which I think is probably a good idea. So um, this is just trying to say if you're under 21, you shouldn't be buying anything that you're going to smoke because that's probably not in your best health interest. And then for those over 21, you're smart enough to make the decisions. <clears throat> and the consequences of those actions. I think the stores are going to be care very careful about what they're doing because obviously if they sell something illegal, they're going to be in a criminal prosecution. So, Senator Cost, I'm going to follow up on that. You've identified the stores being concerned about selling something illegal, and I understand that with the distinction between selling a marijuana product and selling a hemp product. But I'm somewhat perplexed by this notion because stores could take any, I mean, I believe that those stores are violating other food and drug laws and our consumer protection issues, regardless of whether or not they're giving the appearance of selling marijuana, which is really what they're doing, as opposed to trying to market hemp as a consumable product. So what would prohibit these stores from selling other types of weeds? as opposed to hemp, marijuana type related products for the purposes of consumption. Who would regulate that if I was selling a dangerous product for consumption? Madam Chair, thank you for a very interesting and deeply involved question. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I think that's a real issue. And I do think that as we move down the road a little further is going to be something that somebody's going to have to talk about. At the same time, we all know that a number of states around us are uh, moving to recreational as well as medical marijuana. And uh, a lot of the feedback I got from specific emails was that grow up, it's coming to our state to just let it happen. I'm not that ready for it. So I would rather see us still trying to protect as much as we can. 
at this point, this tries to keep it as safe as we can on the public so the police have some handle of being able to deal with it, even though you're right, I cannot deny that. There's the opportunity for products that enhance uh, attraction to kids. There's products that enhance um, what they'll do for you. I think there's other products out there and other lines that are also the same kind of situation that aren't necessarily a drug like this, but uh, other types of drugs. And I think that all can be a, a serious problem in the future, but this bill was never intended for that. And so I'm being conservative with this bill and obviously the police chief when he gets on will be able to maybe answer that question better than I. Senator Costa, I have some other questions that um, for those waiting to testify in the law enforcement community might be in a better position to answer, but I'll ask you as well. It's my understanding that law enforcement has on their persons available to them presumptive tests. And so couldn't an officer, if he suspected that someone was smoking hemp, but thought maybe it was marijuana, perform that presumptive street test associated with that? The tools that they have available to them right now, and Madam Chair, the tools that they have available to them right now are not accurate. And therefore, the reports that they have received from Idaho and different states where they're trying to come up with something have said, we can't verify at this point for sure that it's either one. And Senator Cross, one more follow up. I'm, I'm troubled by the fiscal note, as I have been with all the fiscal notes. Um, where the fiscal impact on, to the judicial system is indeterminable due to an unknown number of cases, which, which certainly is true, but uh, there's two components of this. One, we're making new crimes for the criminal justice system to process. So that's the court systems, but there's a particular agency that's deeply impacted by this. And, and uh, I'm not aware that they're gonna testify or, or have an understanding, but uh, which is, let's say it is hemp, but this is gonna be pursued with a prosecution for a misdemeanor offense. Uh, isn't it true, Senator Koss, that that hemp product needs to be sent to the crime lab for testing to prove that it is not marijuana, it is indeed hemp? And, and what is the burden to the crime lab uh, currently right now, and are they in a position to manage now the testing of hemp? Senator Koss. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the crime lab can test it. It's not as quickly as one would like. Um, of course, there's the implication that because this is not cheap, the amount they need to send in, that it becomes fairly uh, expensive, 100 to $150, if it was proven to be hemp and not marijuana. So uh, who's responsible is the question. And obviously, the police would probably have to, in some way, reimburse that defendant for whatever uh, they had, were out as far as price-wise. Um, so I can see that being a, a difficult path for them because they don't have unlimited funds for that. Uh, the only other way probably to move it is to say, okay, make it all legal and not worry about it, I guess, or close your eyes. And that's really the difficult part for the police right now is do you close your eyes and ignore all of it or what do you do? So. This was hopefully to help undo that. All right, thank you, Senator Cost. Any additional questions? Senator Kolb. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, after listening to the testimony and the explanation of the bill, it, it struck out, struck me that, uh, you know, we don't shift the cost of proof to the user or to the seller. And we're here stuck having to send samples in to get tested and verified. Uh, maybe it's not appropriate right now, but. It would seem like we, if we're going to not legalize marijuana, I'm not, I am grown up and I don't really buy that argument about, you know, my mom told me a long time ago, if you jump, someone jumps off the bridge, you're going to follow them. And, uh, you know, I think the answer for me is no. So if we had uh, MSDSs, if you want to call it that, uh, material data safety sheets, uh, something that would verify the, um, the, the product itself. So law enforcement at least would have a tool 
to uh, to get some information, you know, from a person. And the dispensaries or whatever they are, I guess they aren't dispensaries, but the hemp people that sell the hemp buds and such, uh, that they would have to show what the uh, assayed value is of the uh, THC products in there, as uh, I think it's the USDA specifies. Uh, just to, I guess I'm throwing it out there as a, to maybe some information for myself. Uh, thank you. Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Cole. You know, you have a good point, and uh, it's very possible that uh, I would ask the police chief when he comes on what his thoughts are on that. But it's obviously something that maybe could be amended in here, just so that people do have something to relate to, so they know that it's legit and not just whatever. Uh, Follow up. Uh, so on that note, though, I, I just, the more I think about it, the more I'm perplexed on why it's other folks' responsibility to prove what's inside of a product. And then we spend all this money, the physical note and lab costs and such. It just seems like we're, it's a, you know, it's never ending problem. And, you know, distinguishing between hemp and uh, marijuana products with above 0.3% THC to be, I think, precise. Thank you. Follow up, Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Cole, you make a very, very valid and good point. I certainly can't argue with you. I'm not going to, I don't disagree. Further questions for the good Senator before we move to public comment? All right, seeing none, I have uh, brought into the waiting room, uh, Mr. Odekoven. Welcome, Mr. Odekoven, it's good to see you. And good morning, Madam Chair, Byron Odekoven the executive director for the Wyoming Sheriffs and Chiefs. Joining me today is Chief Roy Eckert from Powell, who's been working with Senator Costin and uh, is the author of an email and description that you received. So by way of introduction, um, let me start by kind of reminding the committee a couple of key points to the dilemma that we face and remind the committee, uh, at least for those who were here a couple of years ago, when we were working on the hemp CBD uh, discussion as a reaction to the federal legislation, that we passed the Wyoming version, if you will, uh, to allow for hemp to be grown and hemp to be uh, dispensed in Wyoming. And the critical point is, is at the point that the federal government does all the rules and regulations and the US Department of Ag, along with the FDA, sets out those rules for, for consumption of hemp related products. And that hasn't happened yet. Uh, those rules aren't released. So what we have today is kind of a hodgepodge of uh, activity, if you will, hemp related activity uh, that is not fully vetted um, through either the FDA or the Department of Ag on how that product is to be dispensed, licensed, labeled, certified, tested for public consumption. So I think that's critical and that part, uh, in part uh, helps define the problem we have today. So folks have jumped the gun, if you will, and they're uh, much to the contrary to the, to the testimony that we received in committee uh, when the bill, initial bill was being passed. Uh, the, the proponents were talking about CBD being an external product rubbed on your knee for knee pain, rubbed on your back, neck, et cetera, uh, for kinds of, uh, was the testimony in committee. Uh, in fact, I think the proponents of the hemp said there was no way they would smoke any product, think claiming that it would be a hemp related product as part of this equation, as that was the wrong way to ingest medicine. It's not, uh, we don't end up uh, crushing up an Advil and putting it in a pipe, so to speak, for our headache. Uh, we don't generally do a, uh, a smoked version of any health related uh, consumable. So we have the dilemma that, that was created by the federal government's lack of candor and follow through with the rules necessary to provide that guidance. Because part of the rules that are anticipated would be that that very THC content would be certified because hemp products are only legal as hemp if they're below 0.03% THC. 
So, and those are to be certified uh, is the way the federal statute describes. But at the moment, the products that we have available that seem to be out and about at the, uh, today are not certified. There is no label other than, trust me, I'm telling you the right story, kind of a label, so to speak. So it makes it very difficult for law enforcement to review. Couple that with the idea that in the states that have chosen to do a state initiative of some form of legality, uh, we end up with the um, buds, if you will, uh, in a jar. Um, so on one side of the store, they look like marijuana buds for smoking. On the other side of the store, they look like hemp buds for smoking. Uh, creates a dilemma, especially for uh, law enforcement as we wrestle with what do we do in this in-between time of when we have product in the state uh, that is not federally authorized and approved and thus technically is not legal versus how do we deal with those some of our citizens who have well intentions of offering what they believe to be a CBD related product for health initiative and then couple it with the smoking of something that they claim you weren't supposed to smoke in the first place. So uh, Madam Chair, with that as kind of the introduction of the overall issue, please allow me to turn it over to Chief Eckert um, who presented you with those pictures uh, and the email and has worked with Senator Cost uh, on the issue. Thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Questions for Mr. Odekoven? Welcome, Chief Eckert. If you could introduce yourself to the committee, um, share your concerns and your thoughts on the bill, we sure would appreciate it. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee. Appreciate the opportunity to, to come before you this morning. I'm Chief Roy Eckert of the Powell Police Department in Powell, Wyoming. Uh, have been working with Senator Cost on this bill. As uh, this came to light in our community rather rapidly, we had some of the first uh, hemp fields in Park County when their first licenses were issued up here and starting to grow. Uh, as Byron mentioned there and Senator Cost brought up, you know, recalled from two years ago when we were in Cheyenne and the legislator was faced with uh, implementing the farm bill and having these discussions with the proponents regarding law enforcement's need to be able to identify marijuana from hemp in the field. And we were, you know, reassured that nobody would smoke hemp because it would just give you a headache. Well, it did not take long for it to appear here. Uh, testifying previously and seeing the contrast between two stores that I have within 20 miles of my community. One, you buy that hemp bud and a foil pack that is labeled as discussed earlier. The other you buy out of gallon jars, like the pictures that I sent in that email. The challenge coming from the 1151-102 that as has also been stated, the use of hemp and hemp products is available is allowable without restriction for everybody and anybody in any way, shape or form. And that creates a problem. When it comes to field contact with somebody in possession of hemp, the ID of the hemp and the testing is, is the issue. The question was asked about presumptive tests that law enforcement have. We do have those, but what they test for is THC. So both hemp and marijuana have THC. So no matter what the potency of the THC, it will still test positive as marijuana for that THC. Yes, the crime lab can now test down to 1%. They cannot get it down to the 0 0.03 for the hemp requirement, but they can get it down to 1% in that testing. However, as Senator Cost stated, it takes eight to 10 grams to be able to test. Now, what is a user quantity for somebody on the street? It's kind of hard to say how much a cherry tomato would weigh. So when you're looking at a hemp bud, there's not an average weight. But if, if for the sake of this discussion, you said one gram for one flower or one hemp bud, now you'd be talking, you would need seven to 10 buds to be able to send that in to be able to test it. So it still isn't an, is not an effective means for law enforcement on the street to be able to send those to the state crime lab and, and hopefully get a, a test back to determine if that's above that 1% THC. Also bring it to the CBD conversation in an email I sent and hopefully you've already received somewhere else, but WASCOP and WPAA, the Wyoming Prevention Action Alliance did a marijuana survey over the last year. Like everybody else, there's lots of surveys, lots of data coming, but I found it interesting. And, and the question we were asking is on the medical marijuana, the hemp, the CBD conversation. 
78.2% of those that were interviewed felt that medical marijuana was a prescription from a doctor and issued through a pharmacy, which we know that's not the case. So I guess bringing that to the CBD conversation as far as the labeling within the bill, uh, the CBD potency or the, the chemicals that are actually in the products that are being sold. And there was an FDA question, I believe, and I'm, that's not my expertise, but what I've learned thus far is the FD, FDA regulates food products. What they do not regulate is supplements. So as long as uh, it's a vitamin or a supplement, it's not regulated. Chief Eckert, isn't it true that here in Wyoming, we could regulate it? I don't care what the FDA does. They're a federal agency, but here in Wyoming, I could make a law regarding the regulation of that product. Yes, Madam Chair, that would be correct. And the challenge we face now is no matter what the FDA says, we have nobody here to enforce it. So, All right, uh, Chief Eckert. So tell me if you decide to arrest somebody or give them a citation for smoking hemp in public, Will you seize that product? We would have to seize that product if we issue a citation. <clears throat> and then that would have to be sent in for testing. Sent in to whom? The state crime lab. And what would they be testing for? The THC potency. Confirming if it's marijuana. Testimony that they don't have the ability to, to distinguish between the THC testimony. So are we deciding whether or not the, the actual crime charged will be hemp or marijuana? Is that what the purpose of sending it to the crime lab would be? Under, under, I'm sorry, ma'am. Under this bill, if we were to cite somebody saying it was... Hemp. Yes. So what would the crime lab be testing for? They would be confirming the presence of THC in the product. Where in this bill does it discuss THC? I don't believe it does. Hmm. Chief, in your community, are the sellers of this product selling it to be consumed? Yes, they are. And in what way are they doing that? The hemp bud itself is being sold either with uh, uh, the traditional uh, marijuana pipe that you would picture, bongs, uh, vape devices. So... I'm sure, Chief, that you are familiar with the, the vaping products that are now on the market, and we can see people vaping with vape pens. Are you familiar with those? Yes, ma'am. What type of um, product goes into the vaping pens? Vaping pens are available for multiple types of products. Uh, tobacco and uh, marijuana oils are common. Uh, Depending on the type of pen and the heat source in it, it can be just about any smokable item. And are those regulated in any way, Chief? We're gaining ground. Uh, many of our cities have passed ordinances to help address some of those issues. Powell had early on uh, created an ordinance to be 21 just to possess the vaping device, no matter what's in it, so that we could differentiate. One of the challenges with a vaping device is it does not give off an odor. So therefore, when somebody is using one, you don't necessarily have a, a clue as to whether or not it's marijuana, tobacco, or just a flavored liquid when they're smoking that device. Questions for the chief? Senator French. Uh, yeah, chief. Um, can you clarify something for me? Um, you said if uh, the, a, a sample of hemp or suspected hemp or whatever is sent to the crime lab, that they can't get below 1% THC. So how would they make the determination? Because hemp is uh, supposed to be under 0.03. Um, so would they be charged with possession of marijuana, even though the testing can't test for hemp? Uh, I'm a little confused on that lab test results. Chief. Yes, Senator, that presents the challenge. Whatever the officer charges the individual with in the field would be the initial charge. It would be up to the prosecutor's office if they wanted to uh, amend that charge to something else. 
if something tests above that 1%, it's going to qualify. It does not qualify as hemp. Therefore, technically, it could be charged as marijuana. Correct. So, uh, Madam Chair, so if it uh, can only test down to 1% as the bottom range of the, uh, the lab test, that person that potentially just had hemp could be charged with possession of marijuana if the THC level is 1%. Or above. Well, sir, if the THC level is 1% or above, it's not hemp. Hemp is required to be 0 0.03. Right, right. I, I understand that. But the lab test on that hemp won't go down to the 0.03. It just goes down to 1%. Is that correct? Chief? Correct. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Chief, it, you know, what I was driving at here is we are sending the product to the crime lab for botanists to just determine that it is a hemp related product, right? That's what, that's what would need to be proven, not necessarily the THC content, but knowing that the crime lab would in fact test the THC content to make sure it was below the 0.03. And if it was, they charge for marijuana. And if it wasn't, um, then it's just the establishment that it's hemp, right? That that's the product being smoked. So I think, I think it's pretty burdensome on the crime lab without hearing from them or uh, understanding their position on the bill and, and not sure what we're trying to accomplish. There might be smarter ways um, than using the same tool in the toolbox to criminalize <laughs> uh, different forms of smoking uh, green leafy substances. Uh, uh, you know, I think the cat's out of the bag, the horse is out of the barn and it's running. So uh, I appreciate the efforts and the need to protect the public, but I do have concerns that we are creating layers and layers of problems um, and regulation on an industry that might need a different type of solution. So I think there's a number of consumer related product regulations that could uh, be underway that would make more sense rather than burdening the criminal justice system um, at a time of budget reductions. But we'll continue those conversations moving forward, no doubt here in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, final questions for the chief, Senator Cooper? Nope, Senator Cole? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, particularly, it seems like there's a huge gap here between our technology, between what we can test and what the criteria is for the product. I mean, it's a huge gap. Uh, we, we do, obviously, we don't have the technology to really test this. And I would also guess that any drug dog that is trained to smell marijuana products would smell these hemp products because uh, they're that sensitive and they and as I understand it, they can't be uh, retrained, actually. I mean, so they're always going to detect a product without, with an unknown. And our laboratories can't definitively test as low as what the requirements are for the, I, th I thought it was the USDA for the product, but uh, they can't test as low as they need to test. So we have a huge technology gap here. I mean, it's massive in the numbers. Uh, and so we're left with a quandary of what to do. I, I, I'd throw it out there to the to the chief that uh, why are we allowing smokable products at this point? It seems like we, uh, after the testimony, I've just heard uh, in the past testimony that uh, that it was never going to be used to be, it's never smoked. And now it is. And so now we have a lack of technology to in fact test it reliably. And where are we at? I mean, where are we going to go from here? Uh, you know, it seems to me that uh, I would question at this point, why we even allow smoking of hemp. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Chief, one more, just, just a follow up, recognizing your intent with the bill. One thing that troubled me and I find curious is that I'm surprised that the hemp producers, the legitimate hemp producers out there who are selling it as an agricultural product for purposes in all of our consumptive goods um, are not doing more about this concern and to ensure the credibility of their industry as a result of a um, commercial product not intended for smoking, right? Not intended to be this alternative, knowing that hemp has many purposes beyond what you see in those little shops in their glass jars, which really being proffered as marijuana when it's not. Um, so I, I do believe law enforcement needs to reach out to the credible um, hemp producers, both in our state and nationally, to understand how they can combat this um, using the tools in their toolbox, recognizing that they likely do not want this type of 
um, product out representing itself to be hemp or their type of industry. I, I think it's harmful to them. Also in that same vein is in our surrounding states, marijuana producers um, and sellers, right? Who don't want to have another product competing probably with their own. And so uh, there's a number of ways through the marketplace rather than the criminal justice system, probably to, to stamp out this type of conduct, but um, just some ideas uh, to work with. So um, Senator French. Just to comment, uh, Madam Chair, on what you just said, the uh, I've talked with different farmers that up in our area uh, that are considering growing hemp. They really do not want marijuana anywhere close because it cross pollinates their crop, and in doing so, it will raise the THC the level above the 0.03, so it'll ruin their crop. And under the state law, they have to disc it up if it tests above that level. So that, that's one thing. And uh, the, the people that grew it up there uh, west of Powell then, and east of Powell too, I guess, the one east of Powell was tore up because it didn't meet the standards. You know, there might've been marijuana somewhere close that cross pollinated it. The crop west of Powell was harvested and they send they uh, send that off, my understanding is to California to process it. But you're correct in, so then that's flowing back into Wyoming as a health aid or whatever they're using that for. So, but that's a good point that they need to get involved in uh, to save their industry because all it takes is, you know, uh, Montana, our entire northern border, and even down the west side a little ways, is now legal. So those marijuana plants are creeping closer to the Powell area. They're within 20 miles. So it could really destroy their industry. But point well taken, they, they need to get involved. Senator Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a lot of discussion here on on the whole viability of the hemp thing, but the question at hand, I guess, is is whether or not we uh, help the law enforcement to prohibit it being smoked in public. Um, is that correct? That's that's all we're really addressing with this bill, uh, Senator Cost, and that's an aid to law enforcement. Is is the reason that we're putting this bill together, is that correct, sir? Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Cooper, that was my intent. And to the best of my knowledge, I believe that was the intent of uh, the chief of police as well. Follow up, Senator Cooper? Uh, yeah, I guess, um, thank you, Madam Chair, I guess, the point is, do we do we step up and help the law enforcement with a tool to prohibit it in public? Um, whether we agree with the production and sale of hemp or not, the law is there. So uh, this is more, to, in my mind, I'm just trying to get it square. This is just a question of if we give the chief and, and our sheriffs the, the tool to uh, to prevent smoking in public. And, of it. So it's immaterial if it's at that point if it's uh, if it's hemp or marijuana. If we pass this, it's still a misdemeanor to public to smoking in public. Is that is that where we're going with this, sir? Senator Cost. Madam Chairman, Senator Cooper, that would that's what this bill would read. Is that it's a misdemeanor? And these are the fines. Thank you. All right, final comments from Mr. Oderkoven, Chief Eckert. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple of thoughts, and I think we've circled back to the actual essence of the bill, and that is the smoking of a hemp-related product in public would be a crime, and thus that may help eliminate some of the marketing, if you will, of jars of buds from across the border it may or may not be under 3% THC. 
Madam Chair, I think you're correct in terms of the assertion that the product would not necessarily need to be sent off to the lab for testing under the essence of the bill because it's a simple define of smoking, very similar to tobacco ordinances. We don't send cigarettes off to be tested uh, when we find someone smoking them. We merely issue the citation for that smoking in public. So I would anticipate in the long run, we would have the citation for the smoking and we would probably have the uh, impact of having those jars of buds removed, if you will, uh, for smoking on, on account of they would need to be in the form of that external or internal intake other than smoking. So uh, and a point of clarity in terms of the state lab, as long as we're on the topic, just so we do not leave it confusing, uh, both the Department of Ag Lab and the state lab can test for quantity of T or uh, percent of THC, but it must be in green leaf form. And it's anticipated, that, again, with the federal statute, that they're testing that crop, if you will, that large uh, amount of green leaf for, for that THC percentage uh, to ensure that it's a hemp related product and not a marijuana product in disguise. So some of that would carry through to this discussion, uh, but I think it's, a, it's important to focus on the essence of the bill of smoking in public of a hemp related product would be illegal, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Wrong speaker button. I kind of got to learn this hybrid format. Uh, any final comments, Chief? Madam Chair Committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak. <clears throat> yes, to clarify, this was originally uh, to do away with smoking of hemp as a whole. Uh, but as the Senator Cost approach, we maybe weren't ready to go that far at this point. Thank you, Chief. Um, st stick around. We're going to have you uh, turn off your cameras. We're going to bring in additional public comment that I know is waiting to speak on this bill. And if, if necessary, we may we may bring you back to answer some of those questions. So uh, those in the waiting room, if you would raise your hand so we can see who would like to speak next on this bill. And we'll let you join us. All right, Ms. Anderson. Welcome, if you would turn on your camera and introduce yourself to the committee, it's great to see you. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chairwoman and the Judiciary Committee for allowing me to speak today. Um, my name is Sophie Anderson and I'm a senior at Cody High School. I'm speaking as a member of Cody Youth for Justice and I would like to speak on behalf of Senate File 90. Passing this bill is extremely important for many reasons, but one of them is that it is illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be able to purchase cigarettes. This is both a federal and state law. The vast majority of people who begin smoking do so before the age of 18. Without Senate File 90, teens would, will be able to legally purchase smokable hemp. This effectively bypasses the laws related to cigarettes and resulting in many additional young people taking up smoking, a habit that leads to lifelong health issues. Um, it would, it's just really, I feel like it's important to level the playing field with um, cigarettes and hemp so that there's not any issues in trying to um, prevent teens from entering a lifestyle that they may not completely understand yet. So thank you for allowing me to speak today. <laughs> Ms. Anderson, it's great to see you again, and uh, we really enjoy hearing from you and getting your perspective from um, the youth of Cody, and, and appreciate your participation in the legislative process. Good senators, do you have questions for Ms. Anderson? All right. Ms. Anderson, thank you so much for taking your time out of your day this morning. Thank you. Great to see you. Anyone else in the waiting room, if you could raise your hand. Wonderful, we're bringing you in. And if, for those of you who have come in and uh, spoken, if you could bring your hand down. And then when you enter into the room, if you could turn your camera on. Hi. Welcome. Welcome, Ms. Mathun. Did I get that correctly? I'm, I'm sure you'll correct me here. Welcome to the Senate Judiciary Committee. If you'd introduce yourself and let us know the correct spelling or the correct pronunciation of your name and share with us your thoughts on this bill. Okay, 
Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Judiciary Committee for letting me speak today. My name is Tashi Matthewin and I'm a senior at Cody High School speaking as a member of Cody Youth for Justice. Senate File 90 prohibits a person of any age from smoking hemp in public. This aspect of Senate File 90 would be extremely helpful to law enforcement. It's illegal to smoke marijuana recreationally in Wyoming. It's impossible without expensive laboratory testing to distinguish between hemp and marijuana. This law wouldn't prevent those over 21 years of age from smoking hemp, which has an extremely low level of THC, but they would not be able to smoke it in public, making it a non-issue for law enforcement. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Methuen. Did I get that correctly? I don't, I don't know that I did. Um, forgive me for not uh, getting that pronunciation correct. Questions? Thank you so much for being here. Again, we appreciate hearing from you and providing this unique perspective from your community. Thank you. All right, Ms. Andre. Welcome, Ms. Andre. If you would introduce yourself to the committee and share with us your thoughts on this bill. Sounds like you're on mute, Ms. Andre. Happens to us all the time. <laughs> Sounds like you're still on mute. It's very comforting us to know that it happens even to highly tech savvy youth. <laughs> and you're just fine, Ms. Andre. Um, I do see Ms. Anderson here as well. And so we'll come back to you, Ms. Andre, when you uh, uh, get the sound worked out. Two things that I've noticed with my computer, Sometimes it's the computer itself where I have the sound muted, and then sometimes it's the application where it's muted. So I'll give you a chance to figure that out. And in the meantime, we'll go to Ms. Sophia Anderson. Ms. Anderson, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. If you would introduce yourself and uh, share your thoughts on the bill. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Judiciary Committee for letting me speak today. My name is Ellie Osborne. I don't know what happened with the uh, name on my screen. Um, I'm a senior at Cody High School and I am speaking as a member of Cody Youth for Justice. I would like to speak on behalf of Senate File 90. Passing this bill is extremely important, important for many reasons. Hemp has the potential to be a very important agriculture product for the state of Wyoming. However, we want to make sure that there are no unintended negative consequences. When, the police, when a police officer is walking down the street and smells marijuana, that officer cannot tell if it's actually marijuana or hemp. Currently, the sample needs to be sent off to a lab and the test co can cost up to $500. Senate file 90 would require anyone smoking hemp to do so in the privacy of a private residence. This requirement means that the police would not be wasting money on tests. Well, thank you so much. Could you please restate your name? Ellie Osborne. Ms. Osborne, thank you so much for being here. I did recognize that Ms. Anderson had already testified, but wondered maybe there were two Sophia Andersons, which, which certainly is possible. But Ms. Osborne, thank you so much for taking the time out of your morning and participating with us. Questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, Ms. Osborne, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I, ha I also have Ms. Anderson here with me. Andre, Andre, okay. Andre here with me. Andre, wonderful. Ms. Andre? Hi. <laughs> I apologize. I don't know why we can't get my microphone working on the other laptop. You, you just made our day, uh, Ms. Andre, because again, we, we struggle with this all the time and assume it's because we're all just old and aren't quite as tech savvy as we should be. <laughs> so no, no. you've made our day. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Andre. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Sarah Andre and I'm a senior at Cody High School. Um, I'm speaking as a member of the Youth for Justice in regard to Senate File 90. I know many kids my age and even younger who would happily smoke hemp in place of a vape or a cigarette until they're legally allowed to use them. This file would not only prohibit the use of hemp, it would also restrict and limit the access to youth. As of now, anyone of any age can legally smoke hemp, and while it may not be the most prevalent problem now, it'd be wise to put a stop to it before it becomes a larger issue. Additionally, there may be short-term expenses but long-term, it'll prevent many healthcare costs. 
Um, and any time the rules are not consistent, it makes it more difficult to enforce, regulate, and understand them. Thank you. Ms. Andre, thank you so much. We appreciate hearing from you. I think that you're right. When there's inconsistent rules, it makes it difficult to enforce them. Questions from the committee? All right, thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate seeing you and um, it was well worth the wait. So thank you, Ms. Andre. Thank you very much. All right, looking for additional public comment. If you um, are hoping to speak on Senate File 90, if you could please raise your hand. And if you're in the room, if you would just stand up and come forward. Mr. Moline. Seeing no one else in the waiting room on, on Zoom is raising their hand. I think we're ready for live public comment. Welcome, Mr. Moline. It's great to see you. <laughs> uh, sorry, Madam Chair, Committee. Brett Moline, Wyoming Farm Bureau Federation, sitting in support of this bill. Um, when we supported hemp production a few years ago, we envisioned it for fiber, oil and seed. We did not envision it to be anything smokable. I have heard that you could smoke a pickup load of it and with the THC so low, you wouldn't even want a half a bag of Doritos. I don't know if that's true. I don't like Doritos, but um, we never envisioned to allow this to be smokable products. As, I, as far as I understand it, smokable products from hemp are still illegal but we, we support this bill to put the penalties on anybody smoking hemp which we believe is, is illegal and not what we envisioned when we supported hemp production. And with that, Madam Chair Committee, I'd be uncharacteristically somewhat brief and sit for any questions. Mr. Marlene, a couple of questions. Uh, do you have any sense representing the industry that does produce hemp in Wyoming? Uh, where are these uh, commercial outlets obtaining their hemp products? Uh, Madam Chair Committee, I don't know. I, that's that's nothing that I work with when I'm working with my agricultural producers. If I understand it right, it's easy to get. I mean, you can you can get on the web and order it in. And as I believe was mentioned before, if it's considered a supplement, there's no regulation of it. You know, for our food products, for our feed products, um, the Wyoming Department of Ag can make sure that it's you know it's meeting our their in ingredient list. But as I understand it, supplements are beyond the realm. So to bring it in, I'm assuming if we've got stores throughout the state that are bringing again, it's, it's not hard. I mean, it, so I think to me, that's, I don't know where to go with it, but you're exactly right. We, you know, with my members, we need to be telling people, this is what we're growing. We're not growing the stuff to go into the store to smoke. We're growing the fiber, the oil, and the seed. And make sure that the Wyoming residents understand what our hemp industry is truly about. It's not the smoking. Yeah, Mr. Moline, it is kind of curious to me. I mean, these, these providers could be selling alfalfa to smoke, and it would be as equally absurd. Isn't that true? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I'll have to say yes. I... <laughs> I, I know I have heard of people grinding up alfalfa <laughs> and selling it as the good stuff and the buyer beware. I mean, they didn't want any Doritos after they smoked a bag of alfalfa leaves, but, but when, whenever there's a market for whatever product, somebody somewhere is going to try to fulfill that. Yeah, Mr. Molina, I just would like to bring to your attention this concept in my mind that I'm certainly familiar with, which is the prosecution of the purchase of oregano. Right, so we all know that oregano looks similar to marijuana. Maybe you don't unless you're in the criminal justice system, but frequently an uns unsuspecting or unsophisticated consumer of marijuana products may buy marijuana that or some marijuana that is mixed with some oregano. And that's the importance of the testing because in the event it is oregano, then that's not a crime to smoke oregano, um, nor is it a crime to purchase oregano as we all have done in our lives. Uh, similar concepts you, you, you've seen in the movies with 
cocaine and flour, right? And so uh, it's not illegal to sell flour or consume flour through your nose or any other way, um, but it is with cocaine. And so I wanna make sure we're not walking down a path that's somewhat um, inconsistent with our other pieces. And I, and I do understand the difference between the hallucinogenic effects of 0.03 THC content and marijuana and hemp products, but I wanna be very careful that what we're really trying to do is deal with the scourge of marijuana afflicting our states. And what these, I think, commercial retailers are likely doing is consuming, confusing the purchasers um, and, and participating in a trend across the country of selling marijuana products in this way. Because there's no reason I, evidently people are telling Senator Koss that there's some type of medical benefit to smoking hemp, but I think that may only be in their heads and not as a result of the hallucinogenic effects. So um, I, th I think this conversation warrants further discussion and whether or not we need the tool in the toolbox for law enforcement to protect consumers from, I think, what is a dangerous practice of smoking an unconsumable product like that, the prevention of teenagers and the regulation of the industry. But um, I think it's a hard conversation to have. Mr. Molini, any comments about well, that? Uh, two comments come to mind, Madam Chair. Perhaps this is not a state issue. I mean, we need to have something done at the federal level. But then, because if I'm correct, marijuana is still illegal under federal law. They're just not, they don't give a tanker's $2 bill to do anything, so they're not. But I think you, when my members, or when anybody's growing hemp in Wyoming, it has to be tested several times. And as uh, Senator France mentioned, if that sample comes back above 0.03%, it's destroyed. I mean, it's boom, it's gone. And if I understand it right, if it's, you know, what the good stuff that they're selling to the state to the South is up like 20%, over 20%, over 30%, Senator Cole indicates. So the difference is between the 0 0.03, but then again, if it's 0 0.04, and it's grown in Wyoming and it's tested and it comes out at 0 0.04, boom, it's gone. Evidently, there's ways to get it into the state as we visited before that if it's not the good stuff that they can sell down south, they can bring it up to Wyoming and unsuspected people will say it's hemp. And so perhaps that's where the regulation is. I, I, I don't know the answer to that, ma'am. I wished I did, but I appreciate the penalties for this illegal product, but it's still an illegal product. With that, Madam Chair, I hope I answered at least one of your questions and I would sit for any, if there's any others. Thank you, Mr. Moline. So just to, just to correct, hemp is not an illegal product and they're smoking hemp. Yes, ma'am, I sit corrected on that, but if it is, if it has been produced correctly and has been tested correctly, at least in Wyoming, if it's if it's not hemp, it's marijuana. I mean, we've drawn that line on the paper. Anything above 0 0.03 is no longer hemp, it's marijuana. This, this bill is about smoking below 0 0.03 hemp. Right. Similarly, it, this bill is about smoking oregano. Oh, I, I, Ma'am, two things I ain't never done. <laughs> so I can't, I can't speak to either one, but I understand your quandary. Uh, you know, if, if it smells like burning alfalfa, is it hemp? Is it oregano? Is it marijuana? What is it? Right. And so the challenge for law enforcement and the reason for the bill is that it smells similar. And so they can smell marijuana being smoked out on the street. And so law enforcement feels like their hands are tied, or in the words of Senator Cost, handcuffed to know how to proceed and what to do when the suspect asserts that they're smoking hemp as opposed to THC. So uh, that's the conundrum. Although I think that they have reasonable suspicion when they smell the smoking of THC to seize that and issue a citation and send it off to the lab. But uh, I, I hear the concerns. Mr. Moline, thank you so much. Any final questions for Mr. Moline? All right, thank you. Any further public comment on this bill? Senator Boner? 
You want to talk about marijuana as a former member of Judiciary Committee? <laughs> I know. I know why you're here, Senator Boner. Thank you. I just figured I'd let you weigh in. All right, seeing none, back to you, Senator Cost. Any final thoughts before we take it to the committee and you come back and join us? I would welcome the opportunity to come back and join you. Please, please do. <laughs> Uh, while we wait for Senator Cost to come back up and join you, I understand that there's a number of people in the waiting room, both here live and on Zoom, to talk about Senate File 25, the animal cruelty bill. I think there's been maybe a lot of anxiety around that bill. There's just going to be one sweet small amendment that hopefully will make the bill significantly more legal, and it should take hopefully maybe five, ten minutes to get that amendment properly through, and that's all that I intend to do this morning. And it has to do with the process associated with the seizure of animals and nothing more. So. Everyone should get paid and animals shall be seized and all is right with the world um, with just one more process. So just to signal that to any of you that might be jammed up for time, that's what the rest of the meeting will look like after we work this bill. Um, welcome back, Senator Cost. It's nice to have you back, back on the diocese. Seeing that public, there's no additional public comment on Senate File 90, we will close public comment. Committee, back to you on this bill. Is there a motion on the bill? Moved by Senator Cost, is there a second? Second. Uh, seconded by Senator Kolb. I will identify that Senator Boner in the room is a co-sponsor on the bill. Uh, moved by Senator Cost, seconded by Senator Kolb. Uh, discussion on the bill, any amendments committee? Madam Chair. Senator French. Uh, just some discussion. Um, everybody had good comments. They truly did. Uh, the, the police chief, uh, Mr. Moline, Senator Cost, the the youth up there and Cody, they all had excellent comments. My concern with it is if a lot of people don't obey the law, right? So some adult, some 30 year old is sitting in the park smoking hemp. I don't know why he would, but let's say he was. And the police approach him and they can't tell if it's hemp or marijuana. So they send it to the lab and that lab can't test down to the 0.03. So that person potentially could be charged with possession of marijuana, which enters them into a whole different ballpark. So that's my concerns. So. Senator Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I'd really like to commend that group of young citizens from, from Cody, they just, they did an excellent job. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud to have that kind of uh, youth in our, in our basin. Um, regarding the question of, of Senator French there, it looks to me like the burden of proof would be on the law enforcement. Um, the only question that we're really looking at, again, in my mind is, is, is this, is it legal to, to, is it, will it be legal to smoke the, any hemp product, hemp or marijuana or whatever it is in public? And to me, that's that's the whole question. Uh, I think I think the uh, um, I believe it was Miss Andre or, or maybe um, the young lady before that nailed it pretty close. She said it, it takes the uh, takes the question away from law enforcement about whether it is or isn't. It's just simply, um, this is a product that's not smokable in public. And so therefore I think uh, it's probably the right direction to go because it, it does help these kids. These kids um, prohibit that from happening if they're under 21. So Thank you, Senator. At least restrict it. Thank you. Senator Kolb. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Well, I'd just like to say that Senator Koss seems to be the expert on weed uh, <laughs> type products. And I'm sure I could look forward to a more discussion on what we're gonna do about this with agriculture folks and come together with a way to handle it together. But I am, uh, I'm for this bill. I think it helps out law enforcement. It's certainly a, quite the mess they've left us with. And uh, I think if we're looking for the federal government to solve our problems, we might be waiting quite a long time. So I think it's up to us. And uh, so I do, I do support this. 
And I look forward to further discussions on this uh, this whole issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, really, the whole purpose of the bill was if they're smoking hemp or their marijuana or whatever in public, the fine is such, it's not a felony, it's just a misdemeanor crime to get it out of the streets and away from the handcuffs of the police. And that's really what the only intent of the bill was. Thank you, Senator Cost. Any final comments on the bill before we do a roll call vote on the bill? Question, Question being called on the bill, roll call vote, please. Senator Cooper? Aye. Senator French? No. Senator Cole? Aye. Senator Cost? Aye. Sen uh, Chairman Nethercott? No. So the bill passes three ayes and two noes. All right, thank you. All right, good Senator. Senator Cost will take that on the floor, of course, as it's his bill. Uh, with that, good senators, we have Senate File 25. Uh, we have the good chairman of the Ag Committee. Um, we are familiar with the bill. We heard it live testimony in the Senate uh, floor. Uh, we've had a chance to read through the bill. Committee, as you might recall, this bill was re-referred to the Judiciary Committee as a result of some concerns expressed regarding the constitutionality of the bill I, from me. And so I um, was able to, thank you so much, um, get the blessing of doing this bill again in committee. So good senators, we'll, we'll hear from Chairman uh, Boner. Chairman Boner, again, just, we get it. Uh, we got a sweet little amendment here that I think you'll have no issues with or anyone else in, in the public who, who has taken great interest in this bill, much to my surprise. So uh, Chairman Boner, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly as a reminder to the committee, uh, the idea of this bill is to allow for a a hearing at the beginning of the process of an animal cruelty case to determine the ownership of the animal. The issue being that uh, oftentimes these animals are considered evidence and they can be quite expensive to maintain. And it's a burden um, uh, on either side of the spectrum. Sometimes it's hard to, uh, for a local animal shelter, for example, to uh, maintain these animals. And sometimes charges are dropped due to no other reason other than uh, that it's expensive to keep those animals. Other times, uh, as a, our statutes stand now, it's perfectly legal to just uh, seize somebody's uh, livestock or, or pet or whatever the case may be and, and uh, uh, dispose of it. Dispose of it, meaning you could sell it, you can put up for adoption um, without due process. And that's actually happened too. So uh, we try to throughout the needle here. I appreciate uh, any work that this committee can uh, do to make sure it's constitutional. I guess that's something we should uh, strive for in this line of work. And uh, appreciate uh, the good uh, chairman's uh, expertise in the legal side of things. I think it, it's, uh, it works out pretty well when we have both the Ag and the Judiciary Committees look at these things. So we can bring that uh, Ag perspective, but also uh, have that practical application when it gets to the court system, make sure everything works the way it's supposed to. So I uh, appreciate your willingness to take this up, Madam Chairman, and I look forward to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions for the good Ag Chairman, Senator Boner. All right, seeing none, uh, stay close. I am going to do this uh, bill a little out of order. Um, I, I know Mr. Illoway, who represents uh, the Cheyenne Animal Shelter here and with the city of Cheyenne has great interest in this bill and there might be others in, um, in Zoom land who would like to speak to this bill, but I think it makes more sense for us to move the bill and work the amendment and then I'll hear public comment as to the amendment. So we're really discussing uh, what's before the committee today. Uh, so, that's the order of things. Uh, so committee, back to you. I need a motion on the bill. I move the bill. Moved by Senator Kolb, is there a second? And seconded by Senator Cost. Uh, any discussion on the bill before we work through the amendment that's been handed out to you, good senators? All right, seeing there's none. Uh, senators, as you might recall, on the floor, one of the concerns presented around around the bill was the constitutional process uh, founded in the 14th Amendment for the Due Process Clause regarding um, the deprivation of property, which um, 
these animals would be considered property of the people of which they're being taken from by the government. And so as a result of the 14th Amendment, uh, in order for those animals to be lawfully seized, there needs to be notice and an opportunity to be heard. Um, the level of that depends on the type of seizure uh, being taken. And so that's the law in a nutshell concerning the constitutionality regarding with deprivation of property and the level of due process. It was my concern, good senators, that when an animal is being seized or animals are being seized, particularly livestock associated with the livelihood of the owner, that a greater hearing needs to occur before those animals can be taken. And so, and I do distinguish the difference between a family pet as opposed to, um, you, you know, someone's entire livelihood of, of livestock that's being uh, seized. So uh, there's, a there's I think, a preoccupation, generally speaking, with animal cruelty and for somehow creating this process that we don't want to protect these animals, which is the basis for why they're being seized. But, but equally important is um, our constitutions and ensuring that that process takes place. So what I have here is adding in on this amendment, the real purpose is an additional hearing associated with the seizure of animals um, when it involves the livelihood of the owner. So let me read the amendment to you. On page four, line six, after the word animal, we are inserting the following language. No animal shall be forfeited without a hearing pursuant to paragraphs Roman numeral six through Roman numeral eight of this subsection, regardless of whether a bond is posted, if the animal is connected to the livelihood or ability to make a living of the owner, period. Then on page nine, line five, after the word animal, Insert, no animal shall be forfeited without a hearing pursuant to subsections G through J of this section, regardless of whether a bond is posted, if the animal is connected to the livelihood or ability to make a living of the owner. So good senators, uh, before we make a motion on that, amendment. I'm, I'm hopeful to hear from public comment, kind of taking this out of order and, and conducting this meeting a little differently, um, give an opportunity for members of the public to kind of digest that proposed amendment, um, think it through. If you're in the waiting room on Zoom, if you would raise your hand, if you would like to speak to the bill and the amendment. Seeing no hands are raised. Mr. Illaway, any comments from you if you'd like to move forward? Welcome, Mr. Illaway. It is great to see you live here in front good, of us today. Good morning, Madam Chairman and committee. I'm Pete Illaway. Um, served in the legislature for 14 years, so I am aware of protocol. Madam Chairman, having just read read the, uh, the proposed amendment, I don't know. I'm certainly hoping that folks that are on the Zoom, uh, especially the director of the animal shelter and, and others uh, may have some, some ideas. I just got a copy from, from your clerk, so I, all, you know, basically, and I think, and, and you certainly well know that the important thing is, is to uh, try and help the animal shelter uh, when they do end up with a dozen uh, hound dogs or whatever. And it, it's a terrible cost uh, until, until that case is settled. And, and bonding is absolutely what's needed. Mr. Elway, I understand those concerns. Um, I also understand the concerns of the Constitution. And so what I fear would happen if the bill as currently written passed without this amendment is that indeed the animal shelter would have those animals underway and they would think that they would be compensated in return by the defendant 
Um, and that defendant would challenge the constitutionality of the law and would likely win that that seizure was unconstitutional as a result of the lack of due process associated with it. And therefore, the animal shelter is stuck holding the bag uh, when they reasonably thought that they were following the law. Those would be my concerns. Um, and, and, as a, and I believe that they'd be well-founded. So I do think that this protects the animal shelter and ensuring that they are compensated um, by the offender associated with that seizure. And I know it's a little bit more burdensome, but such is the constitution um, and, and those requirements. So I do think it strikes a healthy balance. With that, I think Ms. Castaneda is here in the waiting room. Again, if you're there and you hope to speak, please raise your hand now. I, well, the meeting will end at 9.45, so speak now. Uh, public comment is now, and this is your only opportunity to speak. Ms. Castaneda, if you would please uh, show your video. We, we are welcoming you to the Senate Judiciary Committee this morning and happy to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Senator Nethercott, for, um, for taking this bill uh, through this uh, process again. Um, I don't really have a problem necessarily with the amendment other than that some of the dogs that we've gotten, um, including the two, we call them the starvation dogs that were seized from the owner for being left in a trailer for, for many, many weeks without food and water, um, that owner would say that he raises puppies for sale. So he could say that he is um, having his dogs taken away and he, that was his livelihood. So that would be my only problem with that. Um, and I think that this whether this passes or not is going to weigh heavily on our contract negotiations with the city and county. Um, we were able to put into the last year's ordinance in our contract that uh, the city would pay for animals held longer than 10 days after um, they've been seized. Uh, we did not invoice the city back, but just from July 1st of this past year through now, we've had animals that we've had to care for at a cost of 14,005. So, um, if I'm, I'm willing to entertain any questions about how this process works for us, I know that uh, the DA's office um, is in support of this bill, as well as the Police and Sheriff's Association, the uh, Livestock Growers, and um, it's just something that we need to, to, to get through, but I hope that clarifies where we would stand on the amendment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Castaneda. I, I, for clarity, I don't think anyone is against the bill, so I don't think that the issue is for or against the bill. The concern presented was simply to make it more constitutional. It is burdensome. It is onerous. Um, it seems so obvious when you see an animal who is being maltreated to just be able to take it and move appropriate actions. But, but, but think of it in the realm of when you catch somebody on video committing a homicide, and yet they still have all of those procedural processes uh, afforded to them by virtue of the Constitution, <clears throat> even though we see the crime happening and on a on a videotape, which we can clearly show or prove. They even confess, um, and yet we still have those constitutional processes for which we much fulfill, which they are entitled to. And in the same way, this applies. Um, and, and so, as as hard as I think that can be, I think it's important um, to recognize it's one of those balances that we have to strike uh, between doing that. Um, I, I hear your concern about there is a, um, a, a gentleman who has abandoned his animals in a, in a trailer for a period of weeks that are starving and malnourished and dying, um, who claims that he is a breeder um, and, and therefore his livelihood is taken. And, you know, I think the court will be able to, to evaluate that thoughtfully and determine whether or not that really is that individual's livelihood as a result of, you know, the facts concerning that case. Um, you know, if you would like to propose stronger language associated with the livelihood or ability to make a living of the owner, I'm certainly uh, willing to entertain that. But but for now, I think that this is a fair a fair piece. So, thank you, Senator Nethercott. I don't thank know you. how to write stronger language, so um, we would leave that to Mr. Illoway or uh, others involved. And, and keep in mind, Ms. Castaneda Mr. and Mr. Illoway certainly knows this and you can discuss with him. This bill started out as a Senate file, so it's gonna again get worked through the Senate. It'll come back out to the Senate. There'll be an opportunity for additional amendments on the bill in the Senate. Then the bill, uh, assuming it passes the full Senate, will go over to the House, have a House hearing as well and, and, and move through this process. So this is not your only opportunity. Um, thank you, Ms. Castaneda. Thank you. With that, I see Mr. True. Welcome, Mr. True. 
Madam Chairman, thank you. Steve True, Director of the Wyoming Livestock Board. Um, having just heard your amendments, I, I really have a question more than a comment uh, to make sure I follow what you've done here. On the page nine amendment, uh, where no animal is forfeit uh, subservient to G through J, and in H, in section H, that there is a 14 day time period for that hearing to take place. For, for a hearing to take place. Um, but my question would be, in the event of, the, of a potential impoundment of several livestock animals where the, the value of the animal through forfeiture may quickly exceed or be exceeded by the cost of care of those animals, I just wanna make sure that an agency who have uh, done that impoundment could trigger this hearing sooner rather than later. You know, if you went another 14 days after you'd been in the process for a week or two, you may have exceeded that agency's ability to be well from the care of those animals. So that's, that's just my question. If that, if that hearing could be triggered early in the process um, rather than later, by, by your thoughts. And, and I, I, think, I think your amendment cleans up some of the questions in, in the chamber's discussion very well, but that, that's my question just having seen this just now. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, Mr. True, thank you. I do think that that time period could be could be altered. Um, and I would balance two things. One, the pragmatic needs of uh, associated with the costs. So, so what would be the preferred time frame as recommended by the stakeholders balanced with an ability of a defendant um, to respond appropriately. And so, Putting yourself in the shoes of the defendant, what is a reasonable amount of time? Um, and again, it's not to conviction, but a reasonable amount of time to uh, prepare an opportunity to be heard. And so, you know, obviously, 24 hours would be probably too fast. Um, maybe the 14 days is could could be shortened. So, certainly, I think it would be uh, reasonable to shorten that down, but look for feedback from the stakeholders based on an appropriate time. I would not recommend anything less than three days would be my instinct about that, but that's just my personal opinion. Madam Chairman, thank you. And, and then the question would mostly relate to a defendant who refuses or has not posted bond, cannot post bond. Uh, if the bond is posted, they're continuing their care of the livestock through the bond anyway. So that, that would be where that question would apply, but thank you for the answer. And, and the, the amendment seems to be very useful and helpful, thank you. Thank you, Mr. True. And just for the public's understanding too, I did inquire about the ability to post this amendment um, last week when we were preparing it and there is not an ability to post these amendments in advance. So that's, that's what was communicated to me. Um, so I do apologize for hearing it for the first time. It's kind of fast and furious right now, um, but hopefully it's simple enough. So thank you, Mr. True. Any questions for Mr. True? All right, thank you. Mr. Moline, welcome back. Uh, Madam Chair, Committee, Brett Moline, Wyoming Farm Bureau again. Um, support the bill, support the amendment. I would suggest maybe going down to seven days. It's still a week. And I know there's a lot of things that can happen, but a week should be a better balance. The 14 days, I can understand what Director True says. That's a long time. Seven days should be workable for both sides. When that, I will sit for any questions the committee may have for me, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Moline. Questions for Mr. Moline? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Armitage, I know you, you attend our Judiciary Committee meetings often um, on Zoom and and choose to stand silent, but are you, you're the last person left in the waiting room. Is there any comments on this bill? Raise your hand if so. All right, he has, I don't believe he intends to provide public comment on this bill. If so, turn your video on if you would, Mr. Armitage. All right, seeing none, he did not raise his hand for clarity, but we brought him in just in case he did. Uh, so with that, 
uh, good committee members. Public comment um, is closed on the bill and on the amendment. Uh, back to you, committee members. Senator Cost. <clears throat> I'd like to suggest an amendment to move the 14 days down to seven. Okay, uh, Senator Cost, can you identify the page number and line number? I sure can. That would be on page five, uh, line 19, to replace 14 days with seven days. I didn't see it somewhere else, but if it is. And I'm not seeing it anywhere else. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Page 10, line 17 to seven days as well. All right, Senator Koss, I'm going to have you repeat that motion so that our staff gets it clearly. And then if there's a second. So if you could repeat the motion with the proper page number and line numbers. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> okay. The motion is to move the number of days from 14 down to seven. And the first place where that takes place is on page five, line 19. After within, replace 14 with seven and in parentheses seven, and then follow with days after still left in that particular sentence. And then on page 10, we're looking at line 17. Again, the same situation after within, replace 14 with seven in parentheses, the number seven, and then leave days after as the remaining part of that sentence. All right, thank you, Senator Cost. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Senator Kolb. Discussion on the amendment? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of Senator Cost's motion, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion has passed. Committee, back on um, the amendment as discussed and presented, which still needs to be moved and seconded. Um, it moved by Senator Cost. Is, is there a second? Uh, seconded by Senator French. Further discussion on that proposed motion? Question. Question being called. All those in favor of Senator Cost's motion to adopt um, the standing committee amendment number one to Senate file 25, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion has passed. Further amendments on the bill committee? Senator French? Madam Chair, I got an email, maybe uh, everybody got the email from uh, Jennifer Clark uh, that their concern was um, page six, line 12, toward the end of that sentence where it says may, they felt that should say shall. So that sentence would read, if after the hearing, the court finds that no probable cause exists, the animal, instead of may be returned, shall be returned to the owner. Well, uh, Senator French, that is a good concern. Um, any shells in legislation should always be um, carefully scrutinized. However, if there is no probable cause, there is no lawful authority to keep to retain that. And that would be in violation of the Fourth Amendment both the state and the US Constitution. So as much as we want to protect those animals, if there's not a constitutional basis to keep them, it's just not it's just not how that works. So I think that shell needs to remain as a result of as a result of our constitutions. Well, the shall or the may. The shall. It's but, not discretionary if the if there's no lawful basis to keep them. Right. But the sentence says may. They want to change it to oh. shall. What what page six line fourteen? 12. 12. At the right after animal toward the, the end, end of the oh, sentence. They are correct, Senator French. 
Senator Co-Chairman or Chairman Boner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just point out that there's also a May on line nine when talking about the forfeiture animal to the person and authority to enforce. And so we, you know, we uh, that was the top of discussion in the Ag Committee. Uh, the idea being that we give the court the discretion there. That's what uh, we heard from both prosecutors and public defenders. Uh, that ultimately, the you know the judge would be the one making that decision. And so I'd simply submit to the committee for consideration. We're going to change one uh, may maybe you know, look at both there, unless you want to have a uh, um, a. a unproportionate, I guess, a situation there where we give uh, discretion to the court in one instance, but not in the other, depending on the outcome of the case. So. Thank you, Chairman Boner. I, I do believe the recommendation from Ms. Clark is correct, that that 12, uh, on line 12, and there's a difference between line nine and line 12. Um, and so, Senator French, is that a motion that you're making to change page six, line 12 from the May to a shell? Yes, it is. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Senator Kolb. Any discussion on that amendment? Question being called, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, committee, any further amendments on the bill? All right, seeing none. Uh, roll call on the bill, please. Senator Cooper? Aye. Senator French? Aye. Senator Cole? Aye. Senator Cost? Aye. Chairman Nethercott? Aye. The bill passes with five ayes as amended. All right, thank you. Thank you, good senators. Um, we will adjourn the meeting and we'll start session up at 10 a.m. in the chamber. So you have about 10 minutes to get up there. Thanks everyone for your participation this morning.